Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you there. Sorry, I was just reading a book on dreams that I picked up from Amazon. There are many of them, if you Google dream books, and they tell you exactly what symbols mean. Did your teeth fall out? Did you fall off a building? Did a loved one cheat on you with somebody else? You can go to a dream book and they'll sort it out for you. Of course I'm joking. That kind of stuff doesn't work. It doesn't work because dreams are not to do with collective symbolism, at least in the most part. They are personal symbols that arise, which are devised from your psyche over the course of your lifespan. So things that you experience and the way that you associate certain ideas with other ideas and certain people, they will all come together into your own personal mythology that arises within dreams. So how do we interpret our dreams? You know, we recently did two seminars on this for our IPSA studentships. They run about seven hours long. So it's not a simple thing to say this is how you interpret your dreams. However, Steve does have his own personal method, if you like, that's not normally talked about anywhere, really. And it's really, really cool. So we've got a question today from somebody on the Ask a Depth Psychologist tier on Patreon. It's called Merlin's Workshop. And you can join this individual by signing up at that tier or higher to submit a question to us to answer on the channel. And it goes as such. I've had a little experience in interpreting dreams through a year of traditional Jungian analysis. That said, what are the main approaches you take in interpreting your own dreams? I can imagine this will vary due to personality and lifespan development. In essence, how does one effectively separate themselves from the contents to, comp to competently analyze a dream? And how does one become more competent at dream analysis? Difficult question, very difficult, but Steve answers with his own personal method of how he analyzes dreams. So Steve, tell them all about it. A lot of people who we meet, particularly in recent months, who've undergone a traditional Jungian analysis have been mm. very disappointed by mm. their experience, uh, principally because there's a lot of talk and there's no action. They're not given any practical techniques uh, and it's as if the, uh, the recounting of the dream narrative to the analyst is just basically a time filler to keep yeah. the therapy going yeah. over an extended period of time. There's just nothing practical done with it at all. Um, his question was, was less clinical, I think, in the way that he, he'd worded it, then it's more to do with how we might do it. Um, if I, I take it that way, then it's been an evolution uh, over a long time. Um, if I go back to the earliest dreams I can remember, and they are very, very young, and I have remembered them, um, single figures, you know, in terms of age, I was I, I was struck by the by the narrative of them. That was the thing that fascinated me that they were they were real stories, but as such, but there were things in it which were not real and and couldn't relate to the outer world at all. But they had uh, an impulsivity to giving them attention, and I would. Um, talked to my mum about them a lot and I thought she understood I, I know now she didn't she didn't understand it at all but she was just providing a, a receptive vessel if you like to 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 hear uh, these stories from her youngest son but it it fascinated me tremendously and I, I realized very quickly that you, you should pay attention to them but understand that they weren't real in the sense that it was not a replacement for outer experience. So that would be the first thing I would say is that I always regard them as separate to outer reality. That, that's gone through my life with me the whole way. Um, I also noticed the, um, the general trends. Again, before I'd had any training or understanding about how you should approach these things, I was looking for general trends, repeating dreams, uh, themes, that, that kind of thing. I, I just knew that they were important. And, uh, the, the critical series of dreams I had, again, when I was in single figures as a child, which really got me onto this. Um, again, this is just personal disclosure, so I don't know whether this is actually relevant, but bearing in mind the question, perhaps it is, that uh, I would dream that I would wake up at night, everyone else was asleep, everyone, the entire world was gone, and it was as if I'd woken up. And I would go out the house and there would be another light. It wasn't daylight. It wasn't moonlight. It was another kind of light that bathed everywhere. And there were no shadows anywhere. And I had an opportunity in, in this dream series to go out and meet people. I call them people. But of course, I realized that these outer people had no 
external reference at all. I knew that then. This was an inner experience. Would meet people who could communicate things, basically teach me things, and I would gain knowledge in this world, this well-lit world that casts no shadow when everyone else was asleep, everyone I knew in my, my limited physical outer world was asleep. I, I would learn things that they couldn't know, not just didn't know, they couldn't know. Um, but it, I, I also realized that I wasn't actually learning anything. I was just being exposed to the concept that this was possible, that there is another world and that if you go into it, if you can literally wake up inside the darkness and there is light, that casts no shadow. If you can actually do that, you can learn things that other people don't know. And that contributed to uh, a sense of isolation that I had from my peers. Uh, I had a, an external reference to that too, that I was particularly affected by where I lived and the landscape, the countryside around there. And I know I had friends and, and we, we played in the fields and down by the streams and ponds in the same way. It didn't affect them like it affected me. I knew that and I knew that that separated me off from them. I had a sense of connectedness to the land and to some kind of far memory that they didn't seem to have. And that would turn up in the dreams. So those two parallel tracks, the illumination element started to trail off, but the other one, the connection to the land and to living things at a very, very deep level, that's persisted throughout my life, right up to now, I'm 63. So for nearly 60 years, nearly, I've been having that as a recurring uh, theme of my dreams. And uh, both of those dreams were communicated to Franz Jung. He, he asked specifically, what did you dream about as a child? Not your fantasies, what were your dreams? Uh, and we, 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 you know, Pauline shared hers too. We, we, we communicated them. So by the time I, I got to 11, I was exposed to Freud's ideas through my brother who was 18 and he, he'd gone through puberty and he seemed to think that Freud was a good idea for an 11 year old boy to be exposed to. Um, debatable. Probably right, actually. <laughs> well, he probably is, but he kind of left me with the books and, and that, and it was, well, he could have left another kind of book. That might have been more applicable, but he didn't. He, he suggested that I have a look at those. So I was exposed to Freud's theory on dreams, which is nothing like as broad or as deep as Jung's, although there are some very powerful things in there, nevertheless, that should not be overlooked. So for a while, my psychological, if you like, my nascent psychological understanding of, of dreams and how to work with them was prematurely inhibited, should we say, or misdirected, perhaps, by Freudian theory. Then at the age of 16, I encountered Jung, and that just blew the cork for me because someone was speaking the language which I had understood or had at least been exposed to from the psyche, from within, as a very, very young child in terms of what the unconscious was and what dreams were and the fact that they could mean something and it was right and proper to engage with them. That changed my life. I took that forward. So everything else that followed has been built upon that. When we work clinically, we, we, we use a lot of methods, an awful lot of methods. And those who, who are training with us know what, that, what they are. Uh, there's a formal, formal structure and a protocol that all IPSA people follow. There's all the different media, whether they be creative, enactments, whether they be dream re-entry techniques using active imagination, hypnosis, sandra, you name it, all of those things can go into that process. Then there's a method that Jung himself, a written method also used, which we call structured analysis and synthesis, which takes a heck of a lot of effort. But once you've done it a few times, it begins to reduce the chaos that you experience in working with dreams and forces the unconscious then into a representational form that is so structured it will take exception to it but that's a good thing it just needles it if you like sufficiently for it to give a reaction to something because sometimes the unconscious doesn't react to how you approach a dream when you think about it if you took no notice of your dreams they would still come and for the vast majority of people, infinitesimally mm. large number of people in the world who are alive now and probably have ever lived, they never take any attention to their dreams, but the psyche just turns them over anyway. So to get their attention, sometimes you have to do some things to prod them a bit to say, I am paying attention. Is this the right way to do it? And it might say, 
never mind, just get on with it. Or it might say, what are you doing? And then it will send you something to disturb your equilibrium. Or it will compensate or complement the result that you get. And then you start to get a real turnover of communication through your dream work. So we would use the structured analysis and synthesis method, which involves a very limited structure of, if you like, itemizing the dream elements into a column, vertical column, like bullet points. Then you go on your personal associations, sociocultural associations, wider collective associations. This is the process of amplification of the material that, that Jung talked about. And then when we work through all of those, you then have a section which you call synthesis and you resolve it down. You basically rewrite the dream narrative mm. according to an interpretation, which is your synthesis of the analysis. What you've just done before then is the analysis of the dream material. And you, you work that into a synthesis, which forms a statement that you can look at and, and also challenge the psyche with and say, this is why I think it is. And you take an ego position. If you take an ego or an ego position on something and it's way off, the unconscious will react to that because it's, you've, you've basically provoked it in the nicest possible way because you're doing it to suggest that you regard dreams as, as important enough to invest sufficient time out of your daily adaptation to the outer world to take it seriously. That will get attention. But you do, in all honesty, only need in your own development to do this a few times because you're building up a relationship with the psyche of communication. Uh, and then it will it'll come back at you and the channel of communication is open. So structured analysis and synthesis is what is one way that we would do it and do do it now. We certainly do it with patients if we're working in depth. Of course, the caveat is there that if you don't need to go after dreams, don't touch them. Because there are all sorts of consequences of doing that that may be unintended. Um, and certainly with respect to the outcome that a person may expect coming into therapy. So, you know, you, you have to wait for the signal from the situation as a whole that dream analysis is even important. There are other ways of accessing the unconscious. Um, the way that I use now, I've mentioned before, um, which is a, I, I, I try and maintain consciousness as deeply as possible as I'm falling asleep. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Get into that crossover zone. And at that point, I start to remember my other dreams deliberately create them memories of them and put my conscious mind in the role of a dream I go but it's still conscious into a frame or a situation or a narrative from a previous dream that creates an incredible effect and it's scary frankly to ego consciousness no matter how much you prepare yourself for it because usually when we fall asleep the reticular activating system in the brain reduces consciousness at a gradual pace like a descending pendulum and what you'll find is that as you follow that down deeper off the normal level of consciousness if, if you observe the process for long enough there are characteristic stages whereby your thinking processes become disorganized and irrational but still, but still in some sense systematized for example thoughts will come up that are constructed in a sentence form that in terms of their structure makes sense but the content makes no sense at all and if you catch that, you realize, right, I'm on my way. To, we're going down in the elevator. So you keep hold of that. And then just when you think, I'm just about to go here, well, I'll jump into a dream memory. That provokes the unconscious massively. And suddenly you're there. Uh, and it can get really scary. The, the dream landscape just becomes an infinite extension, like it would in a game environment, potentially, where there are no limits. And if you turn and look to your right, but in the dream you didn't, you might find there's another dream waiting there. Uh, whoa, very scary. And then before you know it, you're in an actual dream. It has nothing to do with those dreams, but is an extension of them. But you have consciousness of that process. And you haven't used any substances. You, you've just used an alteration of a natural process. So there is nothing between you and the actual experience. If you use a substance, even though the experiences will be powerful, it is still artifactual in the sense that you have introduced another element, which is adjusting your brain chemistry. And so it's going to affect everything. Far better, if you can, to experience that naturally as a descent, a controlled conscious descent. But having said all of that, I still find it terrifying at, yeah. at a certain point. And you can easily slip over into something like uh, sleep paralysis, 
uh, apparent, apparent out of body experiences, um, night terrors, that kind of thing. You're in that territory at that point, and it's a bit scary, but you can gain a lot. Having said all of that, you need to have a stable enough ago to take with you, because if you don't, you might find that when you wake up again tomorrow, other things have attached themselves to consciousness and therefore to your identity that weren't there before you did this. So you need to be careful again. In some senses, it's like an active imagination process. Now, if you use hypnosis or a similar method, I say similar because there is something unique about hypnosis that I've not experienced in anything else, with the possible exception of some of the forms of tantrism, possible, but only in terms of its intensity. It's probably a slight, still a slightly different process. But if you use hypnosis for extending a dream or dream re-entry, which hypnoanalysts and analytical hypnotherapists, as they call themselves, say is possible, I would argue that you're not actually re-entering or recreating a dream at all. It's still a construction in the moment and your, your, your normal ego is still in place. It's not attenuated to the extent that it is in the example I've just given about a conscious descent. It's a different state, the hypnotic state. You can certainly access your complexes. You can certainly uh, restructure, reframe them. You can do all sorts of amazing things using hypnosis and other kinds of imagery with your complexes by using the, uh, a dream as a prompt for an experience, but it is not the same thing. The closest I've ever gotten to it is, is the process that I've just mentioned. So right now, if you like, today, uh, and even over the past few nights, Pauline often, often has to rescue me from my misadventures. Um, is that all they are? Yeah, of course they are. I mean, <laughs> uh, unfortunate, willful misadventures um, of going into into the psyche in that way. And I get stuck in some horrible sleep paralysis or some night terror or something like that. Uh, so the introverted you, sensing types would much prefer to just sleep. I know. Mm. No, that's you though, isn't it? Yeah. That's what you do. Mm. Anyway, she ends up having to kick me usually. I probably, she probably <laughs> enjoys it, but, but it helps me to wake up and to restore normal consciousness with hopefully some kind of insight. Uh, and I usually find then that, that, that my mind's wider at that point as well as deeper and I can start to associate ideas consciously far better. Um, I can develop my theory far better. I can assimilate uh, experiences of the day to do with the challenge of working with other people clinically um, because you experience a person in the moment for sure, like I, I was saying on another occasion uh, to do with um, accessing typology and, and, and the anima and that kind of thing and using apex level hypnotherapy skills to do that. You can do all of that in the moment, uh, but there is a lag, a time lag, and it can be up to 48 hours, but it could be just a few hours where the unconscious is turning things over and processing things. It might have to do with gene expression. James will, will, will know far more about that than me, but it will be affecting things on that level. Um, and then when you go into, into that, after an, an encounter, if I can call it that, with the reality of another human being in a therapeutic situation, this turnover can be augmented and speeded up by using that particular dream entry technique. And uh, it does raise consciousness and it just gives you a different perspective. It can frighten the life out of you as well. There is also that because you're still pushing something that's not supposed to happen. The unconscious likes to self-regulate under its own steam. It usually doesn't like being provoked, you know, which is why we say don't confront the unconscious, collaborate with it under ideal conditions. Only confront it if you're forced to. And Jung himself said that. So I don't know if that's... What, what, what he wanted as an answer, but that's that's me. You know, if, if he asks uh, from my perspective, that's how I work with dreams now. What about you, love? There's not a lot to add to that, is there? Well, normally there is. But, um, <laughs> no, normally, normally we, we work on each other's dreams all the we, time. We do. Yeah. I, I think that whilst clearly they are valuable, yeah. like probably personally moving a little bit away from them or, or seeing yeah. them as being the, the be all and end all of therapy and mm. accessing the, the unconscious in any kind of meaningful way. Yeah. Because it, it, the whole thing can just become very mesmeric, really. It can. And uh, I, I just worry about, you know, the, the classical Jungian approach, like you say, that just sees it as, a, as a, almost a 
a kind of a, a weekly rumination or yeah. a, a several times a week, re, you know, weekly yeah. rumination that doesn't actually produce anything no. No. that allows you to then go back out into life and, mm. and, and live your life in a, in a, in a more full way. Yeah. Yeah. And um, also to, I mean, you've had this experience particularly of people becoming more demanding of you clinically yeah. as well. Well, once you start to to get into that process, when they see it as a challenge, they do, don't they? And, yeah. and interpret it, this dream. Oh yes. And while you're at it, is another ten. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that time has started. Yeah. You've got the your, clock started. You've got your analytic hour. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And I expect you to analyse eleven dreams. In yeah. That hour. Tell me what they all mean. And yeah. uh, I'll sit here and listen. And I won't believe a word you said. And I'll come back next time with twenty. Yes. So it becomes part you know, of the uh, transcript, it does. doesn't it? Does, it yeah. As well. It can so do. It, it can, can do. Yeah. 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 And also your own inner transference too, which, which is like, you know, if you look inside yourself, if you're not careful, you just see an extension of your ego. You don't see the unconscious as it really is. Mm -hmm. You can do that with dreams if you appropriate dreaming as a function of psychological life to be experienced consciously. If you appropriate that too much to yourself, your ego self, then you'll throw back what you've created. In other words, you've created a complex, a dreaming complex, and you can push that back and then you filter the unconscious's natural turnover of yes. material and development through the thing that you've created to experience it through. Yes. That's a problem with all theory. Mm. Um, typology is a, is a really, really clear example of, of how that's been commercialized to such an extent now it's, it's lost almost all connection to the reality of Jung's ideas and certainly to clinical practice. Do you know, there are Jungians, a lot of Jungians in the UK who will never look at dreams unless they're forced to. The, uh, the London School, Dale and Gardens, Andrew Samuel's place, um, they, uh, they don't ask for dreams at all. Not interested. Jungians who are not interested in dreams. Most of the Jungians who are interested in dreams are found young through the internet. Wow, is that the state of things? Yes. It is amongst the post Jungians, as they call themselves. There's so much that's been completely left behind and forgotten. Uh, there is definitely, in our view, value uh, in in working with dreams. But please understand that the orthodoxy, the Jungian orthodoxy, right now is not what it was in 1961. No, nothing like nothing it. Nothing like it. Nothing like it at all. Very, very different. But yeah, you, you learn a lot about yourself, um, but understand that dreams belong on the inside. They do, and I, th I yeah. think, Steve, your idea of, of having this baseline respect for the unconscious mm. is an important one, because otherwise you can start, again, to demand of yourself that you have more dreams, or yeah. you have a dream, and, and, and for whatever reason, you, your ego is not pleased with the outcome yeah, yeah. Uh, and it would like another one to come along pretty quickly yeah. and, and then you get into that kind of infantile state of wanting yes, of being demanding about it producing things for you and then it will just it'll really it'll point. mess with you like we, like with any other uh process that involves yeah. the unconscious so like a projective technique yeah then. so people yeah. who do tarot card spreads yeah. and they do one and it's like oh i don't like that's that not one. the one i wanted i'll, I'll do another yeah. one yeah. and it's the same with the Ching as well when people use that very often mm. they'll toss the coins or the arrow stalks and oh look it up and, oh, don't like this i'll do it again yes. um, yeah and it, we'll do it again and it becomes a, a compulsive disorder it in does. effect the superstitious it does. compulsive yes, disorder it does if you treat the psyche like that, it will laugh at you, believe mm. me, and it will just send you all sorts of crap and you'll start, you'll have, you'll have fun with yourself, but not be relating to the reality of the unconscious, which will, if it's healthy, just let you get on with it whilst it gets on what, with what it should be doing, yes. which is regulating you, not just in a psychological sense, but in a physiological sense, a metabolic sense, yeah. a genetic sense. It's got a lot to do. It, it doesn't want or need and it has not evolved to deal with the outside world. That's why we have the consciousness that we have. It should principally be externally, socioculturally should, focused. Definitely. Yes. But if you do go in, don't see a, a mirror of yourself in there because that's mm. a delusion. Mm. Don't expect to see some super ordinary version of your ego and call it the Jungian self. That, that's, that's a complete delusion. Yeah. Don't fall for that, whatever you do. You're just looking in the mirror. Let it tell you what it is. Then you'll learn things. Very different way of approaching things. 
Well, sometimes people have the most profound experiences when they're not looking for them. Yeah. They, because uh, then they're receptive. They're, they're they're in a state where the unconscious will will simply provide something or reciprocate, mm. and it hasn't been forced or, or boxed into a corner. It's just simply allows yeah. you to understand something oh, yeah. in, in a different way. Yeah. And, yeah. It's co-present, isn't it? It is. Um, We've seen that happen with people recently oh, that we've yeah. worked with. That, yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they, they've just, they've been aware that something needs to be resolved from within, yeah. but they haven't gone to kind of hunt the unconscious down and demand no. answers. They've been receptive. No. Yeah. And where they've been receptive, that answer comes, has come to them in some through. form. Yeah. yeah. It's co-present. It's there all the time. And a skill in therapy is picking this up is actually... You know, the way that a person communicates to you, the other person is conscious to an extent of what they're saying and what they're emitting in terms of observable behavior. But there are there's an area of unconsciousness for everyone. And sometimes we can interpret that correctly. Um, but usually when that interpretation is made, it's still superficial. To actually catch the presence and activity of, say, a complex yes. operating in someone in real time but more importantly, if they can do it, that's, that's just amazing because it, it demonstrates clearly to that person when they experience it that they are bigger than just their ego. And mm. it's not just a case of, well, there's a box down there somewhere and that's the personal unconscious. Yes. The deeper that is the collective unconscious yes. where the archetypes yeah. are. You realize it is dynamic and it's turning over all yeah. the time. Yeah. That's interesting. That's a place where people learn things and it's a place where they get well Yes, because it strengthens the ego. It does. It strengthens ego consciousness. Yes. And really speaking, that should be the purpose of any kind of in-depth yeah. work. Yeah. Thank you for watching this episode of Young to Live By. If you haven't already, make sure you download our free PDF for integrating your shadow. It includes the most advanced theory on the topic available anywhere on the internet, as well as a full practical breakdown. If you've ever wanted to integrate your shadow, this is honestly the way to do it. Thanks again for watching and take care.